This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you episode 33 of season two of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Westford Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, August 14th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago. The first section is the Westford Center section. The shed at the back of the Congregational Church that was tipped over on the eve of July 4th and remained an unsightly object since has been disposed of. Miss Ella Hildreth has bought it to use in her pasture as a shelter for cows. Mrs. Frank D. Bailey and Miss Hannah Morrill have been enjoying a visit with their sister, Mrs. O.V. Wells. Mrs. Ida M. Gould is visiting friends in Middletown, Connecticut for the remainder of the month of August. Mr. and Mrs. Elmer D. Cole, whose wedding took place last week at the Congregational Church, came up from Lowell on Sunday and attended services. With them were John Seifer and Miss Eva V. Armstrong, who were their attendants at the ceremony. Mr. and Mrs. Cole were dinner guests afterwards at Mrs. Caroline Atwood's, and Mr. Cipher and Miss Armstrong were entertained at Mr. and Mrs. Henry Colburn's. Everything is comparatively quiet just now in our little hilltop village, all except the berry fields. They are regular hives of industry, and the growers are getting a good crop, both in quality and quantity. Large shipments are carried over the road each night to Boston. Reverend uh, Charles P. Marshall, Charles O. Prescott, and John P. Wright left Monday for the camping and tramping trip in the White Mountains. William A. Perkins of Grafton joined this trio en route, and this jolly quartet expect a pleasant week together. Uh, The next section is an obituary. The community were shocked and saddened Wednesday when word was passed about of Deacon Wright's death. He passed away during the early morning hours from heart failure. He had been in poor health for some time, being quite ill a few weeks ago, but had been able to of late to get around the house and out on the piazza. Andrew Stevens Wright was born August 28, 1833. Therefore, had he lived until the 28th of this month, he would have been 76 years of age. He was born on the family homestead in the northwesterly part of the town, being the farm now occupied by Josiah Blodgett. Uh, I believe that farm is up on Millstone Hill. His parents were Jess and Sybil Stevens Wright. In early life, he learned the carpenter's trade from an uncle named Charles Smith living in Charleston. While there, he met and married Miss Mary Abbey Garvin. In 1867, they returned to Westford and lived with and took care of his aged parents, who lived then in the house now occupied by John Good. Afterwards, he lived for a time in the cottage house beyond and later bought the pleasant homestead, which has been his home for so many years. May 6, 1877, he united with the Union Congregational Church, of which he was always a regular and faithful attendant until health failed, and thoroughly interested in its best welfare in every way. A number of years ago, he was appointed one of the church deacons, and since the death of the late Daniel Atwood, has been its senior deacon. He took a thorough interest in the spiritual prosperity of his church, and his was a piety genuine and sincere, which we sometimes call old-fashioned, but thoroughly sincere in the daily life. Mr. Wright was a great lover of music and was a good singer, and for years was a leader in the church choir and took the greatest interest in teaching the young people to sing. He always retained the young heart and cherished a sympathetic and loving interest in young people and their plans and welfare. Mr. and Mrs. Wright had no children of their own, but they helped and befriended many young people, giving them a good start in life who, in the years to come, will cherish their memory with gratitude. In the passing of Mr. Wright, the town loses a just and upright, a good and kind man. He is survived by his widow, who has the sympathy of a wide circle of friends in her bereavement, which severs a companionship of 49 years. 
The funeral was held in the church Friday afternoon at 2.30, preceded by a prayer service at the house. The next section is the About Town section. The game Saturday at Air between Westford and Shirley was won by the old time uh, the old time winning power of the Westford team, five to three. The game was one of a series, best two and three, and the Westfords won the series. Is it not wonderful and comfor comfortable the thought that the Westford team has never lost a series of games played with any team? The nearest escape so far has been with the Nashua team, best three and five. So far, it is a tie. The next game will be an untie unless a draw tie. Today, the Westford team goes to Plymouth, the home of Plymouth Rock, the Mayflower, and Ancient Glory. The Westford team will do well if it prevents enlarging the story. The Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher and family, having got tired waiting for the, quote, old farmer's almanac, end quote, to turn, to turn off the heat, started last Saturday for York Beach, fortunate in their escape from Sunday, the hottest day of the season, meandering around the old the Oak Hill, Sawmill Meadow Brook, and Westford Corner Hill and Valley Conditions, where in the shade it registered 102. It affected the attendance at church, but fishing went on without any ado. Miss Annie Mellon, that's spelled M-E-L-L-E-N, who has been the teacher at the Stony Brook School for the last 10 years, has handed in her resignation to the school committee, having accepted a position at Springfield. As a result of this action, the old, old troublesome question of closing the school and transporting to the center is beginning to reign in place of the rain that ought to reign. Uh, the first rain is... R-E-I-G-N, and the last two reigns are R-A-I-N. At the lawn tennis court of George W. Good at his summer home camp at Forge Pond, there are games every Saturday. Last Saturday, Mr. Good, ex-Mayor Nichols of Everett, Emerson Brothers of Chelmsford, Taylor Brothers of Old Oak and Bucket Farm played. They all claimed the honor of winning. Probably they equaled in their grinning. Edwards and Monahan have the contract for enlarging the mill for Abbott and Company at Forge Village. The announcement is out of the engagement of Miss Ruth Kenworthy to Felix McGowan, who will be remembered as a brother of Mrs. Samuel M. Hutchins. Mrs. Frank C. Hildreth gave a blueberry lawn party on her 100-acre blueberry lawn Wednesday. Miss Ella Wright from Ohio is recuperating old-time association at the old ancestral homestead, the Levi T. Fletcher Farm on Lowell Road. She is a niece of Miss Sarah Richardson, the oldest woman in town, also living at the old homestead over 90 years there. Oscar R. Spaulding, as chairman of the Selectmen, has in his possession a gold-headed ebony cane to be presented to the oldest man in town. Look out there now, you youthful Horace, and spend your spare moments in contriving a speech of acceptance. Miss Marguerite Bannister has been spending her vacation with relatives at the Universal Hub, where the rules of conduct to control the people of Massachusetts are yearly reconstructed. The next section is the Grange section. The Grange held its regular meeting the first Sunday, uh, the first Thursday in August. Only a small company gathered. Some forgot, some neglected, some said it rained. Amidst these and other excuses, only a few came. The initial step was taken towards a course of entertainments this coming fall and, and winter, and Reverend C.P. Marshall, Edson G. Boynton, Alonzo H. Sutherland, and Samuel L. Taylor were appointed a committee to solicit enthusiasm. Tingsboro reported accepting the invitation to Neighbors Night September 16th. Concord Grange invited, invited had not re reported at last meeting. The Grange of this historic old town ought to come and, and let us nibble of its memories just a crumb. Uh, boy, uh, Sam Taylor's really into poetry in, in this particular uh, issue. The lecture's hour, aside from music from the Grange Orchestra, was v devoted to the discussion of the question, which do we derive the most benefit from, education or observation? 
Reverend Charles P. Marshall lit up for education with a searchlight that was entertainingly convincing. Samuel L. Taylor, who wrote this piece, for observation, lit up with a tallow candle and groped his way back in history to find what a man was like before he was contaminated with education. Not finding anything very brilliant, he puffed out his candle and sat down without exhibiting very many of the specimens he had discovered in the infant centuries prior to, quote, the Little Red Schoolhouse, end quote. The next section is called Dutch Supper. Our own Oak Hill, Mrs. Herbert E. Fletcher, gave a, quote, Dutch, end quote, supper at the vestry of the Methodist Episcopal Church of West Chelmsford last week Thursday evening. Besides much funny eating, there was much funny laughing. Why? Just this, a half dozen individual lights came over from the Concord Reformatory. Among those who came were Mr. and Mrs. S. Thompson Blood and Mr. and Mrs. Elmer Shattuck. Both gentlemen were natives and citizens of Pepperell in their youthful good behavior day. Since then, they have been watching the inside character of the reformatory. Mr. Blood gave some of his delightfully laughable speeches of humorous incidents that sometimes overtake portions of the hayseed fraternity, as well as those who do not belong to so honest a fraternity. Mr. Blood came very near to the line of assault, for while he didn't draw blood, he was the means of causing many lame sides from laughter, including the minister. Mrs. Blood also was an accomplice in the lame side affair, having aided with whistling solos. Brookside, Westford Corner, located at Sawmill Meadow Brook, were all in it. The Honorable H. E. Fletcher, with his auto, returned the entertainers to the reformatory that night. The next section is the Graniteville section. Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Dunn and their son Thomas Jr. of Long Island City, New York, are now visiting friends in this vicinity. Edwin Quinn of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, is now visiting with Mr. and Mrs. F. L. Furbush in this village for a few days. Mr. and Mrs. Lester McClenna, with their little daughter Regina, are visiting with friends in Springfield this week. Reverend Samuel H. Armand, pastor of the Methodist Episcopal Church here with Mrs. Armand, starts on a two-week vacation this Saturday. Consequently, there will be no service in church on August 15th and 22nd. The next section is called Field Day. The great gala day and list of sports that was given under the auspices of Court Westford, MCOF of this village, came off on schedule on schedule time at Hillside Park last Saturday afternoon under conditions that were in every way considered ideal and before the largest crowd that ever attended a similar event of this kind. People kept flowing into the gates the entire afternoon and included visitors from Lowell, Nashua, North Chelmsford, West Chelmsford, Ayer, and all the surrounding towns, while Forge Village sent down a large delegation of men, women, and children. The first and most important sporting event, and one that has been looked forward to with such deep interest during the past few weeks, was the baseball game between the Graniteville Blues and the Forge Village Lions, which was won by the Blues in an exciting 10-inning game by the score of 5-3. to three. Both of these teams are very evenly matched, and for three innings, neither side could get a man across the rubber. In the fourth inning, the Forge boys scored one run. In the last half, the Blues scored three runs. Neither side scored the next two innings, but in the seventh, the Forge boys scored one, and in the eighth, got some more runs, tying the score. Neither side scored in the ninth, but in the last half of the tenth, the Blues got busy and, by good batting, pounded out two runs and won the game. It was certainly a great game to win, and to say that the Graniteville crowd went wild would be putting it mildly. So it appears the rivalry between Graniteville and Forge Village goes back many years. After the ball game, the following sports were run off. 100-yard dash won by Scollin of North Chelmsford, Mason of Groton second, boys race won by Francis Gower, George Gagnon second. Hop, step, and jump, 
Skolan first, 36 feet, 9 inches. Mason second, 35 feet, 11 inches. Broad jump, T. Riney first, 9 feet. Skolan second, 8 feet, 11 and a quarter inches. Shot put, won by William Gordon, 35 feet, 8 inches. Skolan second, 30 feet, 4 inches. This ended the sports, which were much enjoyed, and the time was then spent in visiting the various attractions. Joel Wall, in charge of the African Dodger, did a great business, and Edward D. Edward D. Lorenzo, a local boy as the Dodger, came off without a scratch. Next in line was the cane stand, in charge of Bob Heyman and Edward Riney, and they certainly kept things moving the entire afternoon. Then the fishing pond, in charge of the ladies, kept the children amused, while several of the older people threw the line over just for luck. The tonic and cigar stand, in charge of Sonny Jim Daly, was the most popular spot on the grounds, and those stopping for a cool drink had the satisfaction of knowing that they were being served by an expert. At 5.30 o'clock, an excellent old-fashioned baked bean supper was served under the pines, and judging by the way that the homemade food disappeared, it was thoroughly enjoyed by all. Mrs. Julia Raymond sold the checks during the afternoon while the gate was looked after by J.A. Healy. Besides the tonic and cigars, potato chips, ice cream, peanuts, and candy were sold during the afternoon. The supper was in charge of the following efficient committee. Mrs. Peter Healy, matron, Miss Margaret Driscoll, Miss Fanny McCarthy, Miss Josie Provost, assisted by Mrs. J.A. Healy, Mrs. T. Rafferty, Mrs. John McCarthy, Mrs. W.H. Healy. The sporting committee was D.W. Harrington, William Wall, Joe Wall, R.J. Heeman, and Edward Rining. In the evening, a social dance was held in Healy's Hall, excellent music being furnished by the Imperial Orchestra of of Lemonster. Dancing was enjoyed from 7.30 till 11.30 with a short intermission during which ice cream was served in the lower hall. The dance committee was Edward Riney, J. Austin Healy, Fred Defoe, music committee, A.R. Wall, J.A. Healy, Thomas Hughes, W.J. Healy. The dance was very largely attended and a fitting climax to a very successful day. The whole affair was under the able management of Chief Ranger R.J. McCarthy, and much credit is due him and his assistants for the capable manner in which the arrangements were made were carried out. Uh, the MCOF Gala Day was the best ever and a large social and financial success. The last section is the Forge Village section. The Forge Village Lions go to Lowell this Saturday afternoon to play with the Crescents. That's a baseball game. Mr. and Mrs. Felix Leclerc entertained their many friends last week Friday evening. A genuine good time was enjoyed, especially the barn dance. Ice cream and cake was served during the evening. Mrs. A. W. Karkin has gone to Moores, New York, to visit at her childhood's home, hoping the change will be beneficial to her health. The mills here will close September 4th until Thursday, September 9th. Mr. Moore and family of Lowell are occupying the Harley Cottage for a few weeks. That's the news in Westford for the week ending August 14th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury at Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Westford Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you'll join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you. <laughs>